I'm Charlie Harp, the CEO and founder of Clinical Architecture. Today I'm going to try to provide a high-level understanding of how RxNorm can be used to support basic clinical interoperability. I'm going to try to keep it to about 15 minutes, so it's going to be at a fairly high level. Who this is designed for, this little presentation is really for somebody who is aware of what RxNorm is and, and what it's basically used for has some basic database skills, because I'm going to be cruising around some access forms, uh, is interested in leveraging RxNorm or just learning more about it or learning how to get in there and understand it, is not terribly familiar with UMLS Metathesaurus. If you're a UMLS Metathesaurus expert, you probably won't walk away with a lot of <laughs> a, a new information, but you may have a few laughs. Uh, who knows? So let's go ahead and get started. But before we do, I just want to say that if you want to learn more about the UMLS Metathesaurus or RxNorm, there are some great resources on the National Library of Medicine website. There's some really good documentation. You can either Google RxNorm documentation or you can go to the NLM website, which the URL is right up there. Feel free to do that and educate yourself. I'm sure you'll find it very interesting. So let's go ahead and get started. When you download RxNorm, basically it comes with a handful of tables. I'm going to focus primarily in this session on the RxN console table. There are other tables, like there's an RxN rel table, which has relationships. There's the SAT table, which has attributes. But the RxN console table is really the core of where the terminologies in RxNorm live. Um, it is a copy, a structural copy, of the MR console table from the UMLS Metathesaurus, which provides the same function for the, the Metathesaurus. And one of the things that a lot of people, I think, struggle with with RxNorm and the Metathesaurus is it's kind of cryptic. And the reason it's cryptic is a lot of these structures were built more than a few years ago. And part of the artifacts you see, if you're a content archaeologist like myself, is you see that some of these names, or all of these names, are under eight characters long. So what you end up with is some very cryptic, short, abbreviated names. But that's based upon limitations in databases from several years ago or file systems from several years ago. So if you look at RxN CONSO, RxN stands for RxNorm. And CONSO, um, just like in MR CONSO and the Metathesaurus, stands for Concepts and Sources. So when you think about what the RxN CONSO table is, is it's really a bunch of source terms coming from the sources out there like First Data Bank, Multum, Lexicomp, Gold Standard. And it's basically creating a concept that links across the sources that allows you to equate them with each other. So Rx Console is the concept and the sources in a single table. All right? The first thing I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it without a ton of explanation because I'm trying to keep this to 15 minutes, is there's a, a number of columns in this table that just aren't used by RxNorm. There are columns that some of them are used in UMLS, some of them aren't even used there. But they're all here, and I think they can be confusing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a bunch of them that either aren't populated or aren't terribly useful for what we're going to go through today, and I am going to hide them. And I'm going to do the same thing with these guys over here. I'll go ahead and... All right, so what we have left is we have the Rx CUI, which the CUI stands for Concept Unique Identifier, which is really the pivot, the pivot around which the other concepts hang. You have the source, so who is the source of the terminology, the term type, the code value of the source term, and the description or the string for the source term. And then a suppressed flag, which pretty much is only used with RxNorm terms. What I'm going to do further is I'm going to talk a little bit about the term type. If you look at these tables, you've got the CUI, which is your conceptual pivot, which we'll talk about more. You've got the source, which the sources are basically the people that are providing content in RxNorm so that it can be normalized across concepts. The term type, I think, can be confusing to people. And let me tell you why. First of all, a lot of these additional columns in RxNorm 
live in the RxN doc. The values are there. So Rx norm is not a true normalized relational structure the way most of us think about it. So for example, a lot of those columns that I got rid of, the values are all in Rxn doc. So that's actually the column name, and these are the values in the descriptions. So for example, if we look at Rxn console, and we look at the TTY, if we go into Rxn doc, and we scroll all the way down, there are the TTY column values. And in Rxn doc, there's also multiple rows per value. So for example, for the term type of DN, there's the expanded form, which is really the description, and the TTY class, which is a grouping. And a TTY row can be multiple classes. So you can have two or three or four rows per term. So if we were to normalize out the term types in UMLS, what we would end up with are 244 distinct values that can be in the term type column in RxN console. Now that's another thing that's slightly confusing. When the RxN doc table is, is output in Rx norm, it's actually an exact copy of the UMLS MR doc table, which means there are values in here that aren't used. So if we look at these 244 distinct term types and we distinct out the things that are actually used in Rx norm, you get a much more manageable list of 32. So here you have the 32 term types that we're going to encounter when we go through Rx norm. The other thing to know about term types is when I first encountered UMLS and RX norm, I made the assumption that the term types were equal, that they were kind of a, a conceptual pivot, but that's not the case. So, for example, you would think that if you came in with a term type of CD, you would leave with a term type of CD. That's not the case. You might come in with a CD and leave with a DP. You might come in with an ingredient and leave with the generic drug name. The term types and how they're utilized in Rx norm can be very specific to the source and how the source has been mapped into Rx norm. So that's an important thing to know when you're looking at these things. So let's go ahead and actually walk through an example in Rxn console. Now what I did is I built a table using a query where I filtered out the suppressed items I eliminated SNOMED because a lot of people aren't, aren't probably struggling with SNOMED drug codes right now. Everything I'm going to go through works with SNOMED as well, but there's a lot of SNOMED terms. So by eliminating them, I just made it a little bit more manageable. I also got rid of some of the duplicate term types from some of the sources, once again, to simplify the examples we're going to walk through. So in Rx Core, the CARX Core query result, what we're going to look at is we're going to start out looking at adenosine. So if we grab this block, what you see here is you see that there's an Rx CUI, a concept unique identifier for Rx norm that represents the ingredient of adenosine. And when you look across the other terms, you'll notice that we've got three terms coming in from Multum, which is also Lexicomp. There's a generic name term type, which is the multum denom for adenosine. There's a brand name of adenosine, and there's an ingredient code of adenosine. From the SPL, there's a unicode for adenosine. From NDDF, there are three HIC sequence numbers for adenosine. So if I wanted to come in and exchange data on adenosine, I could come in with, let's say, the HIC sequence number 4537. And let's say I've got to take that allergy and I've got to transcode that so that I can put it into my other system, my other hospital system, which happens to be using Multum. What I could do is I would come in with this code, grab its Rx CUI, find the appropriate code in Multum, and Multum happens to do allergy screening with the DNUM codes. So I would actually grab a term type of GN for the MMSL value of 296 and transcode it to D00164. And by doing so, I've taken my NDDF allergy for adenosine and turned it into a Multum allergy for adenosine. That's a great example of how what you come in with, the term type, may not be what you leave with. 
And of course, we've also got the VA code for adenosine as well. So if I'm exchanging data between the VA and a Multum or an NDDF, I would do that. This is also a good time to point out that not all vendors provide codes at all levels, at least through the publicly available Rx norm. So for example, you're not seeing a Metaspan code, ingredient code here. You're not seeing a gold standard ingredient code or a Micrometics ingredient code. It's because they're not currently providing that to Rx norm. Some of them provide those codes through, through files that you can buy if you're a customer of theirs um, so that you can get access to that level of information. Now, let's actually move to a, a slightly different example. Let's find a dispensable product because most of the, of the providers, the content providers, do supply things at the dispensable level, which helps with doing e-prescribing and other medication transactions at the dispensable level. So here's an example of methylprednisolone, 8 milligrams oral tablet. If we grab that block, basically you can see that you've got a gold standard code, you've got a Metaspan code, MDDB is Metaspan, this is an alchemy marketed drug code, you've got a brand name code and a essentially an MMDC from Multum. You've got two FDA codes that you could use, You've got an NEDF code, a GCN sequence number of 6742, and then you've got two codes that actually are different term types. And you'll see this a lot too, where you might have two term types from the same source with the same number. But you can't always factor out, and this is important to note, you can't always just factor out the term type because in some cases, like we saw with ingredients, the, the term type and, and the codes might actually have meaning. So in this case you'd want to know that I'm coming in with a CD from the VA and I'm going to leave with a CD from Multum. All right. The other thing to know, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up because I'm getting near the end of the 15 minutes and hopefully this was helpful. The other thing to know is, is that you can't always rely on Rx norm. There, sometimes there are there are things that are not in Rx norm. Sometimes there are things that are uh, are not mapped the way you might expect an Rx norm. If you're going to write code around using these Rx norm tables, it's got to be resilient and that it might not come back with a hit. And you might need to, to fail over and do some free text uh, translation to be able to accommodate that or present them with a list. The other thing you'll note is sometimes you might come in, like when we were dealing with the adenosine example, if you come into 296 and you come in with a DNUM and you need to go to First Data Bank, you've got three. So in some cases, now all of these should be active ingredients in the first data bank product, and all of them should result in an equal allergy hit, I would expect. But this is an example where it, it's not always extremely straightforward. Well, I hope you found that useful. A few final thoughts. One is, if you download Rx Norm and start to play with it, a lot can be done with Rx and Conso. Uh, I recommend before diving into some of the more complex tables like the relationship table or the attribute table, get familiar with the ARCs and CONSO structures and data, play around with it for a while, get comfortable with how some of those columns tie into RX and DOC, and uh, see what it can and can't do for you. The other thing I'd like to share is that Clinical Architecture is just about to roll out a new product called Symmetical which is designed to support high performance mapping of medical terms, whether they're labs, meds, or drugs, or allergies. The goal there is to do a whole lot of mapping really fast. It's pretty slick. Uh, we're very proud of it. And it does leverage uh, Rx Norm and UMLS where appropriate. Uh, but that's not all. It does some other, some other interesting things as well. The other thing I'd like to say is extend a special thanks to the folks at the National Library of Medicine I think that the UMLS and Rx Norm are fantastic resources and also thanks to the drug content vendors for providing their terms to the National Library of Medicine because without that it, it would make interoperability between these systems that much more difficult. And at the end of the day, interoperability is really about improving efficiency, improving the, uh, the high fidelity exchange of patient data. Which, which ultimately serves to improve patient safety. So thanks to them and thanks to you for your time and attention. And if clinical architecture can ever be of service, please don't hesitate to give us a shout.